Welcome to Around the Empire, the show that takes you around the U.S. Empire. I'm your host, Dan Wright. I'm your co-host, Joanne Leon. And on this episode, April 27th, 2017, we interview Joe Lawrence about Kurdish fighters in Iraq and Syria, particularly the YPG and YPJ, the Yazidi YBS, and the Syrian Democratic Forces. We discussed his trips in photography in Raqqa and Sinjar, the recent Turkish airstrikes on Kurdish groups, and the precarious triangle of the United States, Turkey, and the Syrian Kurds. Joe Lawrence, known professionally as Joey L., is a Canadian-born photographer now based in Brooklyn who specializes in long-term portrait photography projects. He is also a film director. One of his documentaries is titled Guerrilla Fighters of Kurdistan. Joey has traveled far and done work in Iraq, Syria, Ethiopia, and India. Many well-known faces and high-profile organizations are among his clients. Here is that interview. Hello, Joe. Thanks for being here with us. Really appreciate it. Excited to talk to you today. Hey, Joe. Hey, guys. Thank you very much for having me. You had some of my friends on before, such as my uh, fellow uh, tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist, uh, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> we had someone I admire a lot, uh, Professor Landis. Me and Brad, we've both come to the conclusion that um, the people who believe in maybe the more mainstream narrative are more so the the most conspiracy theorist. <laughs> so we're safe. <laughs> <laughs> right. I would tend to agree with that. It's become quite a story. The official story has become quite a yarn. So your experience with the Kurdish groups is fascinating. You've actually been embedded in, in Iraq and Syria. You're one of the very few, I believe, photographers and journalists who's been embedded with the Raqqa operation. And I also wanted to talk today about the Turkish airstrikes on April 24th, earlier this week. So how about if we just start with, could you explain, first of all, to our listeners, maybe just a quick explanation of who the various Kurdish groups are? Because there are a lot of acronyms that get thrown around, and I, I even have to look them up sometimes. So, Yes. So where to begin? There's, there's a lot of different Kurdish factions. They all do not share the same political ideology. So first, uh, let's talk about ones who follow Ojalan theory, which is Abdullah Ojalan, the founder of the PKK. That's one train of thought in the Kurdish movements. And it is the one that is the, the most powerful inside Syria. So there's that train of thought. And there's also the Iraqi Kurds, who forces are known as Peshmerga. And those are completely different uh, political movements who run the KRG, Kurdistan Regional Government, political party in power is KDP, but there's also other political groups there. So those are kind of the two different, let's say the most prominent or well-known ideologies governing what we know as Kurdistan. Kurdistan itself, I mean, I could talk for an hour about its history and how it was divided up between uh, the modern nation states that we know today. But basically, the ancient homeland of Kurds is split between the borders of Iraq, Syria, Iran, and Turkey, with Turkey having probably the largest population of Kurds of all of them. So fast forward to the Syrian civil war. The Syrian regime actually retreated from those areas of Syria, uh, which the Kurds call Rojava, leaving a power vacuum that was filled by a armed group known as YPG, and uh, YPG got a lot of their inspiration and training from PKK, which is a separatist uh, Kurdish organization that started as a separatist group, let's say, inside Turkey. And then over time, their ideology evolved more to wanting to fight for autonomy within Turkey. So not an independent Kurdistan state, let's say, but autonomy and protection for minority rights. So the group YPG inside Syria is becoming very famous, very well known since they were the ones who first stopped ISIS in Kobani in the famous battle. They became on our television screens. But that ideology actually links back to some of the founders of the PKK and more importantly, the way that that ideology evolved and grew and changed over time from its roots in its war against Turkey. So where does that leave everything nowadays, well, the most current up-to-date acronym is called SDF, SDF, Syrian Democratic Forces. 
That is a umbrella organization inside Syria that includes mainly YPG, but also has absorbed various fragmented rebel factions. So these are former FSA who had fought the regime previously and were either kicked out by extremist groups or Al-Qaeda-linked groups and didn't want to fight their own Syrian brothers, they say in their own words, and joined up with Kurds to fight ISIS and other extremist groups. And as well as uh, a lot of Arabs from recent cities that they've liberated, such as Manbij and the Rocket Countryside, have also joined SDF coalition. So it is a pluralistic faction, but I would say a lot of its military capabilities come from YPG organizational structure, um, which of course is coming from the guerrilla insurgency for decades inside Turkey. Now, it doesn't mean they're the same group. A lot of analysts like to write off YPG as if they are the same as the PKK. That is not true. They're separate organizations. But they share a lot of the same ideological inspiration from the writings of the founder of the PKK. So that's sort of an overview, if that makes sense, if I didn't confuse you with all those acronyms. The Arab groups that you just mentioned that are part of the SDF, that's the Syrian Arab Coalition, I think they call it? Well, I mean, the coalition loves this word, Syrian Arab Coalition. I personally, it troubles me a little bit how they want to stay away from the word YPG. You know, like they'll say it sometimes, but they'll say, oh, we're arming Syrian Arab Coalition. It's just a friendly way of saying that it's that it's a pluralistic force and they're including Arabs in it. But I mean, to be honest, there's thousands of Arabs inside YPG. It started as a, as a Kurdish movement, but that ideology appeals to a lot of different ethnic groups inside Syria. It's not just for Kurds. So even in YPG, you can find uh, units that can't speak Kurdish. They just speak Arabic. And in those units, you can find Kurdish people speaking Arabic and Arabic people. And if you were to say like the sectarian narrative that uh, Western analysts specifically take on and you tell that to people on the ground there, they'd probably laugh at you. These analysts have never actually seen SDF themselves. They more believe in, let's say, Turkish propaganda or uh, papers that are funded by some elements in the Gulf to undermine these fighters. Do they have, are they a coherent group, all of SDF? Uh, yes, of course. Yeah. And do, do they have a name there, for them? Yeah, so the structure... I that links all these groups together as SDF, so Syrian Democratic Forces. And that's why the coalition has actually chosen them as sort of their champion or their partner against Mm -hmm. ISIS. It's not because they were the first people they went to. Believe me, the Americans would have preferred, uh, you know, to partner with uh, FSA factions or quote-unquote moderate rebel factions. And they tried many times, and every single one was a complete failure until they started working with the YPG and honestly, the, the thing that separates them is just their organizational structure and uh, command. So when the coalition wants something done, they're talking to a group of commanders versus a hundred different disconnected groups yeah. that, that are the FSA. And believe me, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, an easy choice for the coalition to make at this point. And they're getting pressure at every single corner now uh, for this relationship. But in terms of an an actual effective army, number one, but also number two, they can govern their areas and they have a whole civilian structure and different uh, even civilian organizations, local councils, uh, women's groups, everything that allow them to have good governance over their areas as well. An example of this is Manbij. A lot of analysts were saying, and they still haven't updated their articles, actually, they were saying that, oh... When YPG enters Manbij, there's going to be a sectarian disaster. The Kurds are going to ethnically cleanse Arabs. Actually, none of that happened. And if you can compare uh, the way Manbij is governed to even some cities that are governed by the Turkish-led Euphrates Shield, those are the, the, the Turk-led rebel groups are just a complete disaster compared to what SDF or some of their um, government structures linked have established. So that's sort of what's what's going on. It, it doesn't mean they're perfect by any means. And it also doesn't mean that uh, they shouldn't be criticized or helped a- along with some good articles pointing out some of the flaws of their system. I think that's so important. 
even the fact that they're being held to international standards as an armed group inside Syria is quite an amazing thing in and of itself. So that's sort of the current uh, situation. So the SDF is this umbrella organization. It's a coalition. When you hear analysts talk about this, they kind of say every Kurdish force fighting is fighting ultimately to establish a Kurdistan entity. To what extent is that SDF's goal, or is it simply to free themselves from ISIS and the Assad government and other places? I mean, what what's the overlap between this claim made by particularly Turkey, of course, and others, or maybe a fear even? That That's a very good question. Those people who make that claim that YPG are somehow separatists from Syria, at the same time, they're supporting Euphrates Shield, which looks like a Turkish land-grabbing exercise, okay? Um, they also don't acknowledge history and what Syria actually is and how it was formed post sykes pico What YPG is actually fighting for is not an independent statehood such as the Iraqi Kurds. It's autonomy. Now, if they were offered, you know, full country status, would they take it? <laughs> well, maybe. But the thing is, is these critics have never actually read the philosophy or the published material that these groups actually say they follow and do follow and share themselves. These are the writings of Abdullah Ojalan. Now, of course, it's easy to write him off as a terrorist leader, but this is very much the philosophy that these groups follow. And for any analyst that wants to study Syria, if they're reading about Arar al-Sham, if they're reading about Jibbet al-Nusra, they have to also at this point, because SDF has become so powerful, they're going to have to read Ojalan to get inside their minds. So basically, I will you know, make the ideology very, very simple for the sake of this conversation. But the idea is, is that the state structure becomes a tool of oppression in and itself. So they will criticize the Iraqi Kurds for making uh, their own Kurdish state because they'll say, what about the other minority groups inside your Kurdistan? Are you going to become the Turkey and suppress them? Also, we criticize you because do you have real freedom? For example, your state is propped up by Turkey, by oil agreements, by economic agreements, Historically, Kurds have been thrown under the bus by their state sponsor. How is this project any different? Instead, we want a true state. We want a true Kurdistan. And of course, we're going to run it. (laughs) So that's their uh, ideology. So when we talk about a separatist movement from Syria, it's not really true in the sense that they're grasping for statehood. It's that they just want minority rights uh, for not just Kurds, but all groups in the North Federation, is, as it's being called now. Even Rojava is a Kurdish word for West Kurdistan. They stopped using this word because it felt too Kurd-centric. They wanted to reach out to all uh, ethnic groups. Now, what does this mean in the future? It means that maybe a future regime post-Assad could integrate this you know, becoming powerful state into the structure of Syria itself, or maybe they could get full independence. In their minds, I think that's less important than just getting, you know, very basic things such as cultural rights, uh, language rights. I mean, before the war, they couldn't speak their language in public. They couldn't do anything Kurdish, even the name Syria, Syrian Arab Republic. So you can see how over time these uh, state uh, structures have suppressed minority groups. Okay, so the response, which was one of the, the, basically the European powers carved up the Middle East, which is part of the reason it's so dysfunctional, because it was supposed to be divide and rule. So they wanted different ethnic groups at each other's throats. The actual plan itself was, I think, discovered after the Russian Revolution, because the Tsar, the Romanov government got a copy of it. It was never disclosed by the, the Western powers. And in this, I guess I want to say the time of Nasser, roughly around that time, there was something called Arab nationalism or pan-Arab nationalism, right? Mm-hmm. So the Ba'athist party, which is both Saddam and Assad, his father as well as him, is a kind of Arab nationalist, although somewhat left-wing, uh, kind of, in, in ideology at least, not in practice. In um, Syrian Ba'ath is a left-wing, yes. Yeah. So the the fear, I guess, or what they're projecting onto the Kurdish groups is that they are like them and that they have an ethno-nationalist agenda 
And these are two competing ethno-nationalist agenda where what you seem to be saying, if I'm correct, is Kurds are not really thinking in those terms. It's more of a sort of independence movement that isn't necessarily trying to build, you're saying, a sort of solidly ethno-nationalist program. Is that, is that fair or correct me if I'm wrong? No, that is, that is correct. And I think that that's why so many analysts get it wrong and have such a hard time understanding this because it is such a new idea. You can read uh, writings on what they call democratic confederalism, libertarian socialism, these kind of ideas that started off as uh, very uh, anarchist ideas, but, but uh, evolved into something actually practical. So all those writers that influenced that movement criticized Marxist-Leninism, then they criticized anarchism, and now this sort of new system is uh, basically a large experiment which is being performed inside that region, inside Syria. And, um, of course, the experiment has its, has its flaws, um, but it also, considering that this region is under embargo from every single country that surrounds it, and they've been able to thrive in such a brutal conflict like Syrian civil war, I think is a testament to them doing an actual pretty good job given the limited resources that they have. At this time, in uh, those areas that are run by SDF, they actually have 300,000 uh, IDPs of all different kind of ethnicities. Now, that's nothing compared to what Turkey took in or Jordan took in or what Lebanon took in or whatever, but considering this region is in, under embargo and no goods are able to actually you know, move in there as well as economic restrictions, that's a pretty damn good job all the while fighting a war at the same time uh, with very light weapons. Of course, the coalition provides airstrikes, but these guys are fighting with grenades and AK-47. So I kind of joke with my Kurdish friends sometimes. It's like if, if the American government gave you guys what they gave FSA, you guys would have conquered the entire country by now. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say just surviving in this hellish war alone I mean, is pretty amazing. Uh, now, can you just to clarify for people listening, the Pentagon, the American Defense Department, uh, for those who don't know, the CIA is, is supporting some of the groups. So FSA, I think, was getting weapons from the CIA. Of course, then they get jacked by al-Nusra. And then, but the Pentagon is apparently working with some of the Kurdish groups. Which groups is the U.S. Defense Department coordinating with? Do you know? Yes. Yeah, so, th so there's two separate government branches. Of course, there's the CIA branch, which is, I would say, probably more the troublemaker, of course, in the Syrian civil war. Their, let's say, clandestine goal, of course, is regime change. Now, in terms of the groups, you know, through the Pentagon and CENTCOM and all that, that back the SDF, their mission focus has been to get rid of ISIS. So, so all of the wings of government that have the goal of getting rid of ISIS have chosen the most effective partner, which is SDF. So in that regard, uh, SDF is acting as the ground force, and uh, the coalition is mostly in the skies providing airstrikes. Now, at this time also, they have inserted American special forces as well, and uh, there's some a few hundred now uh, special forces actually among SDF, and I've seen them. I've actually run into them on the ground uh, we actually weren't supposed to see one, <laughs> one another. So it was just more of a, like, I, I wrote this in an uh, article, but it's like, a, hey, dude, I'm like, that's it. Weren't they yeah. actually on a roof? <laughs> yeah, they were preparing some equipment for an operation, and they were taking orders from uh, Rojda and coordinating with her. She's the leader of uh, this Raqqa operation. But they're on the ground, and they're fighting. They're using heavy weapons. They're also calling in airstrikes directly because... I'm not a military expert, but I would imagine when an SDF commander calls in an airstrike, it probably has to go through a certain level of filtration to verify the target before the jets uh, doing sorties above can strike. But if a special forces member is there and calls it in, I would imagine it can just, you know, go right away. So there's that advantage to having them there. And also there's been a recent buildup of American bases um, in that region you can actually see it with uh, satellite imagery of uh, entire airstrips being paved, uh, concrete bunkers going up, as well as a lot of uh, helicopters and U.S. Army strikers uh, build up. So some people aren't, you know, I was kind of thinking after Raqqa, after ISIS is gone, this is when America backstabbed the Kurds once again. But after seeing those bases, I don't know if they're ready to kind of stay there 
for the long haul or just to have a wing inside Syria, a country where they would you know, never be allowed to have a base before the war. Maybe that's the big plan, but for most of us, I think it's up in the air and nobody really knows what's going on. Or they could turn those bases over to the Kurds. Yeah, well, the they'll... Yeah, it's it is it is already under the control of the Kurds in a way because I mean the Americans do have such a small footprint in there compared to SDF. Um, they are under the authority of SDF or of that region. But what they're planning to do with all these materials, I'm not really sure to be honest. And I think the reason I kind of wanted that clarification because so the SDF is coordinating with the Pentagon to to take on what is President Trump's reportedly primary goal, which is to destroy ISIS. Now let's talk about this airstrike by Turkey, which is what is so confusing. If you're being told that, or if you have a situation where the, the U.S. is supporting a group to overthrow, its, use its primary goal, ISIS, and now you have Turkey. Now, Turkey attacked SDF forces, correct? Turkey has attacked SDF forces since the beginning of, of the war. It's just they first started doing it clandestinely through other groups. So Turkey invested in a lot of extremist groups since the very beginning of the war, such as ISIS, such as al-Nusra Front, and Arar al-Sham, because they were doing two goals of Turkey's for them. One was to fight the Assad regime, and the other was to totally crush Kurdish ambitions. So although Turkey just, you're right, they did openly do airstrikes on SDF positions, for them it's nothing new. It's just a new version of attacking them. Now, why is this? It's because Turkey likes to, you know, put a blanket on all these groups and say that they're all PKK. You know, this is the same terrorist group, you know, we've been fighting since 1984. They're all the same. There's no difference between them, blah, blah, blah. They're just a Syrian branch. So that's how Turkey gets away with striking uh, YPG, uh, as well as a Yazidi militia called YBS, or the local dialect, uh, Yebeshe, the way of pronouncing it. But I'll say YBS, it's easier, because they just can paint this terrorism umbrella over all of them, because Turkey's biggest fear is what happens when across the border we have Rojava, Kurds get their rights. Uh Uh-oh, in Iraq, Kurds are getting their rights. What happens when our own native Kurdish population that we have also suppressed starts to get inspired and rises up? So this is very troubling for Turkey. So even they'll attack former FSA groups that are alongside SDF and also call them PKK. So these new airstrikes, I believe that they're a way to challenge uh, the U.S. relationship with SDF because I think rather stupidly, the U.S. administration has said, SDF has no links to PKK, They're no, nothing at all. They're separate organizations, but to say they have no links is just like really stupid. Uh, because now it's coming back to haunt them. Because what Turkey is doing is at the same time they striked YBS and PKK in Sinjar Mountain in Iraq, the same strike, they strike YPG in, inside Syria, and they listen. They put their ear to the ground and they say, what are the Americans going to do? Are they going to say, we are against the ones in Syria, but it's okay in Iraq because that's PKK? Are they going to stop bluffing and just throw in their whole lot with YPG and say that, you know, these are our champions. So it's just a new way to escalate. And it's a new way to try to tear these two allies apart, America and SDF. The reactions to the Turkey, the strikes from Turkey were pretty interesting from the different factions. I'll just go through them real, real fast. So Iraqi Kurdistan, they blamed the PKK. These, these strikes, we should say, they killed both the YPG, YPJ fighters, I, I believe either 12 or 20. I've seen varying oh, yeah. numbers. Yeah, they also killed the entire media department of, of YPG. Yeah, that was that was interesting, I thought, the choice of targets. And then they killed some Peshmerga fighters as well. Yes. Some are denying, some, some sources actually deny that or don't report that part. But the government of Kurdistan, or I guess specifically the Peshmerga ministry, right away came out and justified that because this would be very embarrassing for them that their, that their ally Turkey killed uh, their own fighters. And so they immediately blamed the PKK and they said the PKK have to get out of Sinjar and so on and so forth. 
so that was the first reaction I saw, actually. The Iraqi government, a little bit later, they condemned the strikes, but they mainly focused on it being a violation of their sovereignty. So the U.S. State Department condemned the strike. They, well, they said they were very concerned, deeply concerned. That was the first reaction. Yeah, they're running they're out of in words. They're really between a rock and a hard place here. You got their NATO ally attacking their most crucial ground force ally in Syria. The YPJ was really not happy about that from what I saw. And they said that the United States has to do a more concrete, I think they use the word concrete response. They weren't happy with the very serious, you know, warnings, verbal warnings. And they actually said that they might pull out of the Raqqa operation if the United States doesn't do a more appropriate response. So after that, I saw on social media, I saw CENTCOM put out a message and they said, quote, we are troubled by Turkey airstrikes on SDF and Kurdish forces. Our partner forces have been killed by Turkey strike. They have made many sacrifices to defeat ISIS. We believe that our partner forces were struck in northern Syria and our Peshmerga partner forces were struck in Sinjar, Iraq. So they made it very specific, you know, called them their partners and such. And then the last thing I saw was, uh, I think it was the State Department said, those strikes by Turkey threaten the safety of our coalition personnel. So that was Mm -hmm. pretty serious warning, you know. Lastly, Erdogan said, well, we're just going to keep doing this. Our operations in Shingal and northern Syria will continue, he said. So just so you can, you know, just to put lay that out there. And the Russians and Syrian, Syrian regime purposely waited to put out a statement. And then a, a little bit later, they also condemned it. Oh, that's, yeah. But they were waiting. <laughs> yeah, that's they were interesting. They're doing a dramatic pause on purpose. Huh. That is interesting. I, that's funny. Yes. I didn't notice that. Yeah. So... I think the strikes on Sinjar Mountain need their own separate history of why they're important. And I can walk you through what actually happened there if you're interested. Please. Yeah. Everyone should remember, too, that the plight of the Yazidis being massacred by ISIS is the whole reason why the United States is back in Iraq. I mean, nobody thought you could ever get us uh, to put troops back in Iraq. But as you know, President Obama, I would say, seized on that particular event to convince the country that we needed to put boots on the ground back in Iraq. Although at the time he was saying it would just be airstrikes, he specifically said we will not have boots on the ground. And but as we know, we do have boots on the ground. They're just advisors, <laughs> sneakers. Yes. Marcus so in uh, in August two thousand fourteen when the Islamic State was doing their huge offensive in that region, and um, they were approaching Sinjar Mountain, the more conventional forces like Peshmerga and Iraqi army, they were all fleeing from every area, including Sinjar itself. Now, ISIS at that time was coming from a variety of places, but mostly Tel Afar, and they'd committed, you know, atrocious uh, war crimes, and it was very apparent what this group was capable of. But basically, those forces left uh, Yazidis to sort of fend for themselves, and they had evacuated that area. They actually also confiscated weapons from uh, some Yazidi villages and things like that, basically just leaving them to themselves to get slaughtered. I even spoke with some Yazidis who had tried to get away, and Peshmerga had closed uh, checkpoints saying, everything's fine, you shouldn't leave. ISIS isn't coming, blah, blah, blah. So you can believe, you know, what chain of events you want, but let's say the Peshmerga retreated from that area, which, by the way, Sinjar is a disputed zone between Baghdad and KRG, and on paper it doesn't really belong to one or the other. So the idea that KRG releases a statement blaming these strikes on PKK and they should leave, actually they don't really have the right to say that, nor does Baghdad. And my personal belief is that the local people, Yazidi people, should be allowed to vote and choose whatever they want, whether that's 
uh, self-administration, their own autonomy, which after talking with the Yazidis, that's what I think most of them want. And uh, they don't have to be a part of PKK government structure or job or nothing, just self-determination. But if they want to be part of KRG, that's fine too. They can vote for that. If they want to remain part of a Baghdad structure, they can vote for that too. But neither of those groups is really letting them do that at this time. So back to August 2014, after those forces ran away, we had what has been recognized now by the UN as a genocide. So ISIS came in, uh, they killed thousands of men, kidnapped thousands of women for uh, sexual slavery, as well as, um, let's say, slaves that were taken back inside of um, their territory. So we see a lot of ISIS tunnels and things like that being dug. I really doubt it's their fighters. It's probably men that they have enslaved from not just Yazidi, but probably Shia groups and everything like that. Just doing labor in, you know, all kinds of horrific conditions you can probably imagine. So the Yazidi were being slaughtered and some individual YPG fighters came down from Syria, Rojava, and entered Sinjar Mountain through Syria. And they established a humanitarian corridor And through that corridor, they managed to start saving Yazidi families and evacuating them. This was actually before YPG command gave an official order to do it. This was just individual Kurds being moved and going to help Yazidi people. Now, after that, PKK also sent their fighters through Syria and entered through that corridor. And they unified everything and made an actual... Uh, structure to evacuate families. So there were like whole truckloads of thousands of families leaving from being stranded on the mountain directly through ISIS territory. It's a, honestly, it's a heroic scene out of the movie. And those people who did that don't get enough credit for it. So now you have thousands of Yazidis settled in uh, Syria, as well as other parts of Iraqi Kurdistan and basic in Turkey and everywhere from being displaced. Now, after that happened, of course, uh, YPG and PKK fought ISIS inside Sinjar City. At that time, Peshmerga reorganized himself, and they also joined and fought alongside one another. In Sinjar Mountain, I saw Peshmerga and guerrillas fighting side by side in, in the same trenches. Basically, Peshmerga had positions around the hill of the city, but in the heart of the city, near the bazaar, which was the main front line, was actually PKK as well as YPG, and a new uh, militia that they started called YBS. So this is where YBS comes in, which the Turkish did airstrikes on. So YBS are made up of Yazidi people, former refugees who ran away, that joined this new armed group and got training by PKK commanders to have their own force. So ideologically, a lot of the things PKK tell them really resonate. You know, this is the blueprint for self-administration, for cultural rights. All those things make sense, especially when you're a refugee and your family just got massacred. Remember that refugee camps are prime recruiting grounds for many armed groups. So Yebeshe is a Yazidi-centric militia that's focused on Yazidi rights. So they fought inside Sinjar as well as uh, on the front lines near the bazaar as well. After ISIS was defeated inside Sinjar, that's when all these different factions uh, started to have a rivalry. You know, when your large common enemy that is the glue that holds you together is gone, then you start the infighting. So that's what's actually happening now. There's been a lot of tensions building up between uh, YBS and Peshmerga because YBS says, we're from here, we're Yazidis from Sinjar, and we actually do not want Peshmerga here. And then Peshmerga say, no, this is uh, under the authority of uh, KRG. All you guys are just a bunch of PKK. Get out of here. But actually, 80% of YBS is locals from Sinjar. So they cast this PKK uh, blanket on them. Now, on my first trip to Sinjar in uh, March 2015, it is true that PKK had a much larger presence than they do now. But after the city was liberated, all those same commanders went on to fight elsewhere, especially inside Turkey. A lot of the commanders that I met that fought inside Sinjar uh, in March 2015 ended up dying in uh, places like Sur, uh, inside uh, the Kurdistan, inside Turkey. So all those commanders left, and um, it's mostly Yazidis now. So those strikes that Turkey did, I say, were on survivors 
of the genocide and they are Yazidi people. And from their own minds, their own belief, the view from the ground is that Turkey is just trying to massacre us once again. They first tried with their proxy force, ISIS, they failed. Now they're trying to blow us out of the sky. So this is how the viewpoint is kind of how these views really resonate from, from the ground level. So this is just going to solidify antagonism from the, the Yazidis and Kurt. Obviously, this, the effect of the bombing is going to make it, I mean, I imagine there's going to be retaliation or at least it's going to be ill will and, and having any prospect of ending uh, the difficult relationship between Turkey and Kurdish insurgents or Kurdish people within Turkey. I mean, that's a pretty fair analysis, right? That's exactly what Turkey seeks to do, actually. They want to drive a wedge between America and their key partners, and they want to say, how far are you invested with these groups? Because everyone knows what's going on. They know these groups are linked. So are you all in with the Kurds, or are you with us? What are you going to do? So they're making their PR efforts very, very challenging. Also, the two places that they struck are very interesting in and themselves. I've actually slept in the bases that they blew up. Wow. The main the main key one on Sinjar Mountain is a communications uh, radio tower. So you can imagine this is also a group headquarters for broadcasting out command as well as a local radio station. On the Syrian side, it's also a large radio tower, and it's a place which is known to be visited by high commanders within SDF. So they're probably looking to assassinate media ap- apparatus, communications, but as well as key leadership. Um, and in that effort, they actually failed, although they did kill uh, 20 SDF fighters. Couldn't this also backfire? Because if you're the Trump administration, you don't care about human rights, you don't care about democracy, you don't care about any of those things. In fact, you're, well, briefly, we're kind of saying Assad can stay and then this other thing happened. But if your primary goal, your overriding paramount objective is to destroy ISIS and you don't necessarily need Turkey that much, I mean, I guess you need Incirlik. You need some things from Turkey, but this kind this is actually kind of the wrong time to try to leverage the United States because these are the forces that can actually take on and defeat ISIS on the ground. So isn't this kind of, I would see this almost as a blunder by Turkey because this is the worst time to leverage that relationship because we actually do need the SDF. The U.S. forces actually do need the SDF because they're the only force on the ground that can really take out ISIS, or is that a misread? No, that's true, and that's the military's perspective. I mean, the military loves SDF because imagine working with this force versus working with, like, the FSA. <laughs> They're like, oh, my God, thank Every God these people aren't going to, like, yeah, we can embed with them. They're not going to, like, threaten to cut our he- heads off. That's good. Um, <laughs> but, but, but you know, you know, there's a lot of government wings that are also being affected here. It's not just military, right? There's a lot of lobbyists inside Washington that, are, you know, uh, they have real viewpoints of the other ties that America has to Turkey, such as NATO or even economic partners. I mean, the big bad boogeyman is Russia, and Turkey is a NATO ally against Russia in a strategic spot. So there's a lot of at stake here. It's not just a fight against ISIS. So what Turkey is trying to do is leverage all those other points and throw it on to this uh, fight against ISIS. And, of course, you're right when you say Turkey is taking a large gamble because at this point, America has invested so much resources into making ISIS the big bad boogeyman of, of the West that maybe they will, you know, choose this partner over them for this fight and say, if you don't like it, too bad. And that's what Turkey wants to know. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what they end up doing. Some people smarter than I have been saying, you know, maybe the Americans might make a deal with the Russians to keep Turkey away because Russia's Russia's allowed to do that. And since they have that common goal anyway, maybe they could go that route. Russia also has a good relationship with SDF. So maybe that's one way they'll go. But honestly, at this point, it's all just public posturing and we'll have to see what actions are actually done on the ground. Because you read those press statements and you're right. They say like, we are not only deeply concerned, but now we are deep, deep, deeply concerned. It's like, what, when is this? Uh, so Turkey is saying, you know, when is this going to end and what are you guys going to actually do? So we're going to stir up this shit storm and do two strikes. And that's, I think, what they're doing. But isn't there ill will re- vis-a-vis Turkey? Because everybody knows, and we learned this in those WikiLeaks emails as well, that Turkey created the jihadi highway, if you like, and these other, Turkey was 
one of the main backers of ISIS. Up until this Istanbul bombing on New Year's, they were one of their main benefactors. They, they've had played this double game in the region. And so if I'm in you know, the Department of Defense and I've been given the objective, and remember, Donald Trump has basically said, I'm not going to think about all these advanced, you know, diplomatic and commercial. I'm just yielding this to the generals. I'm going to let the generals do it. So he's like giving <laughs> it to the generals, right? <laughs> Thank it's you. It's going to be so great. It's going to be so It's going to be great. tremendous. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> Believe me. They're going to be destroyed. Okay. <laughs> but um, so he's yielding all this to the generals. Now, the generals know that ISIS was for a long time a Turkish client. And so when they look at this kind of leveraging attempt, you know, say, wait a minute, we're trying to destroy a force that you fomented, that you created, that you provided mm. resources to. You think we're going to forget that? I, so I just wonder, I just think it's, it's, it's gamble. I think gamble is the right word for this because it's so, I mean, people know the history. They don't have, maybe we don't have long memories here in the United States of amnesia, but we remember at least you know, a few years ago when you had Hillary Clinton saying, I'm going into the region to talk to Saudi Arabia, to talk to Turkey and Qatar and the UAE about stop giving money to ISIS. So I imagine if you've just yielded this to the military, the military knows what Turkey's game's been. I, I just wonder if they're going to let those other factors you talked about, which are legitimate, get in, in way of the sort of, you know, just seek and destroy mission they seem to have embraced and that the Trump administration has basically said, let the generals do it. That is the big question. Believe me, if a dipshit like me knows that Turkey supports ISIS, those guys know. And they have direct evidence. And of course, they're using it as leverage. But what I wonder is like, you know, what dirt do the Turks have on the American administration? Because early in the war, it's not just Turkey opening up this porous border jihadi highway. Everybody was complicit in turning a blind eye to that. So although they came from Turkish soil, this international jihad that destroyed Syria, there's a lot of different governments complicit. And I would imagine there's some very interesting conversations recorded and documents that Turkey probably also has. So everyone's probably, you know, uh, undermining one another and backstabbing one another. I would love to be a fly on the wall in some of those uh, conversations. But, um, you know, it, 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 it could be anyone's guess. Um, I do believe that SDF is probably the only force that could take rock at this time. If they want to try another program, it's going to cost millions, possibly billions of dollars and years and years of waiting. Because Turkey tried to fight ISIS inside Al Bab, and they sure did not do a very good job because the military is at a very weak point post coup. So, on one level, there's ties that America has to Turkey that run on so many important strategic, business, and economic levels. But on the military levels, they're definitely at one another's throat. Your guess is as good as mine what happens next, but this is definitely a very serious escalation that is going to force somebody just to say plainly what they're doing. Also, if Russia cooperates with the United States in putting pressure on Turkey, that could actually work, I believe. If Russia decides, I mean, that's a really key and fairly newly evolved relationship, Russia and Turkey. It could work, but then they're dealing, you know, with their age-old enemy instead of their NATO ally, what does that actually mean? You know, that's a very complicated issue to get into. Going to the Russians to protect them from their own ally, I don't know if that's exactly a good uh, geopolitical maneuver. <laughs> Depends on, on who, or which faction, I guess. But they, I mean, they did one time, there was a sort of collaboration on Aleppo. But other than that, we have not seen any, let's say, synergy between the... Yeah, I don't. I don't think we're going to see much synergy. As a matter of fact, so, I don't think. Uh, I don't think they will stop the Raqqa operation. I mean, it's definitely normal for SDF to th- to threaten such a thing. I mean, if they're up Shit's Creek fighting ISIS in, in Raqqa and America's allowing Turkey to strike them, that's something that they cannot tolerate and they should stop militarily. But as far as what I've seen. Um, and speaking with some local people on the ground, the operations to surround and isolate Raqqa have not stopped yet. So there's probably some very interesting conversations happening at this time right now. And probably someone asking for guarantees. I mean, what happens the day after, for example, when ISIS is probably defeated or becomes small enough to be a non-factor, which is kind of what it was before? I mean, what happens then? Does Turkey just say, okay, great. Now you, you don't have any more excuse to support these people. ISIS is gone. 
and now we're really going to go to town. We're going to have all these airstrikes. And what does the U.S. do then? Or what does anybody else do if, if after ISIS, the, the main reason that the U.S. It feels compelled to work with them in this specific instance is to defeat ISIS? Well, what happens after ISIS is defeated? Does Turkey then say, OK, gloves are off? That's why SDF has kept the channel open with the Russians and with the Syrian regime. It's not because they like them. I mean, the uh, political party, the PYD's leadership has been tortured and assassinated by the regime before the war. They do not see eye to eye, believe me. But the thing is, is you're right. When America goes, does this movement have a better chance, um, you, you know, having a relationship with some post-Assad regime versus the Americans if they're just going to have a military agreement only. That's fine. Maybe they have both agreed on that. And uh, maybe they'll have to go to the other side to uh, protect their autonomy after. I mean, these groups since the starting of the Syrian war, YPG didn't want to wholeheartedly join the revolution because those rebels could not guarantee their rights. And they found that those backs those groups were being backed by their supreme enemy, Turkey. So why would they join a revolution to overthrow the regime with the same groups that are fighting them are going to oppress them equally or maybe more so? So they didn't join the rebels. They were neutral to the rebels. At the same time, they didn't want to join the regime. They wanted to be neutral to the regime. So they kept this third path, and now that's sort of being decided what is uh, the future of this? Now, the Syrian regime and the Russians could easily make an, an agreement with Turkey to weaken SDF as well, because maybe they see eye to eye on crushing Kurdish ambitions uh, for that reason. So, yeah, there's a lot of ways that SDF can sort of um, become a major lever in this war. And I, I said this on another podcast, but for us who studied the Kurdish side of the war, it used to be a very fringe sort of like on the side thing that everyone else believed was kind of a sideshow and didn't matter. But nowadays it's becoming really, really important and probably one of the most uh, powerful factions inside Syria. Definitely does matter. I feel like we have not spent any time on your, your work here, which is I'll put some links in our show notes, but really I'm not just saying this because he's here. I mean, he's done extraordinary work with the Kurds. And some of the portraits that he's done of, with the time he spent in, see, I believe most of these came from the Raqqa operation, but I haven't even gotten through all of them yet. But for example, Joe, you spent some time with the leader of the uh, Wrath of Euphrates operation, which is, that's the, the Raqqa operation. I don't know how many people know who's commanding that operation. Can you tell us a little bit of, about her and, for our listeners, I'll put a link and you you have to see the, the portrait and the photos that are there. They're, they're stunning. I mean, my work is uh, portrait photography. I'm not really a photojournalist, although some things sort of stylistically bleed over. But I've always been a portrait photographer and a lot of my projects are very long term. So they include very long visits to these regions. I mean, the longest trip I had in Iraq and Syria was 40 days embedded with these fighters. So it takes a long time. And um, basically, um, it starts with portraits, but I also get, you know, seeing them uh, working and observing them in their environments as well. So with Rojda, Rojda is the leader of the operation um, from YPJ of uh, Wrath of the Euphrates, which is the one that's uh, isolating and surrounding Raqqa. And... Um, She's not just like a lot of people think, oh, look at these groups, propaganda, putting a woman front and center to get like the Americans on board. That's actually not true. Rojda is a real uh, military leader. You can actually see some articles that Jack Murphy wrote on Soft Rep where he interviewed some uh, special forces who worked alongside Rojda. They all say that she's a badass. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yes, yeah, no, she's a real mil military leader. Um, her role is more organizing the various units into one unified vision. So she'll go around the front lines and make sure that um, people have what they need and one group is communicating effectively with the other. She's also a key communicator with the American coalition to organize these groups. So when the special forces are among them, they're talking with Rojda and asking for entry into front lines. Can you get this group to watch the road for suicide cars while we do this? So she, she's very much on the organizational side. 
And um, yeah, so I was with Rojda with uh, some of her fighters on the front lines of uh, Raqqa. And um, yeah, we saw some very incredible things. So that was your latest trip. Uh, yes, right? that was the most recent one. Yep. In November. Yeah, at the end of November. And at that same time, you went to that. Con- Is that the same trip? Did you go to the conference? Uh, <laughs> yes. I don't know if you want to talk about that at all. Yeah, sure. I mean, on that same trip, I went. I, I did a lot of things on that trip. I was uh, south of Mosul and Kyara, photographing the oil fires there that ISIS had lit. After that. We uh, flew to Beirut and uh, was invited to Damascus by the regime itself. Then after that, that's when I flew back. And uh, somehow, which I can't say, allegedly somehow went on to the other side (laughs) of the country, (laughs) not through a regime, but some other way, and then went with uh, some of the Kurdish groups there on the same trip. Now, um Damascus was very interesting because uh, I have never seen that conflict from that side before. Of course, in Kamishlo, which is in the Kurdish part, there's a, a block that's controlled by the regime, and I always have to hold my breath going through their checkpoint, making sure they don't see me because you're a photographer in their country without a <laughs> without a visa, you know. Uh-huh. But at that time, we were invited, and I had told them everything you know uh i want you to know that this is my work i've snuck into your country twice before and um i don't want any problems if i enter so just tell me if i can go or not and because the conference was a a special deal they did miraculously allow me to enter and um as we approached uh, the border i started seeing you know the flags and the pictures of assad I started feeling like I had to throw up, honestly, because I had conditioned myself to be afraid of those signs when I've come across them before in Syria, let's say. But yeah, we to me, I was never really in- interested in the conference because I'm a, I'm a photographer and, you know, we're going to get a bunch of shitheads from the regime trying to brainwash us or whatever. I thought, like, oh, God, I don't want to hear this, this whining. Um, but actually, to be honest, it was very interesting. And I actually did learn a lot. But me as a photographer, I was able to take off and do some stuff around the streets. But e- even then, uh, I mean, government Syria is like a is like a police state, and there's a lot of suspicion, a lot of paranoia, which is rightfully so. Um, but you kind of, to be honest, uh, you kind of feel when you're there why people revolted against the Syrian regime in the first place. It is a very not nice feeling being there. It made me appreciate a lot of the Kurdish cities that are free, how open they feel and how you can just walk around and basically do anything you want. And there's no one spying on you. It made me realize actually how special that was inside Syria. So me, myself, I've always been understanding of the regime and I've never really taken on the viewpoint, let's say the mainstream news viewpoint where, you know, rebels are all, amazing freedom fighters and it's the evil corrupt Syrian government, blah, blah, blah. That's also too simple of a narrative. But yeah, you know, I was there. I, I had an open mind. I saw things from their eyes and that's it. That's it didn't change really my perspective in terms of, you know, not liking the Assad regime. It just made me see the struggle more from the perspective of Syrian people who are just sort of caught in the middle and they don't want to live under the rebels because it would be way worse than the Assad regime at this point. And what those protesters were calling for in 2011 in no way reflects what the rebels are fighting for nowadays. So they've chosen to seek some kind of normality or some kind of structure under Syrian government control. And the way of life there is a lot easier than being with the rebels, unfortunately. Uh, It didn't work out in their favor. It's been hijacked by extremist groups who run the show now. So you went to this notorious conference and you saw things. Did you have a minder or were you a little bit more free? Yes and no. So when I wanted to go out and take photographs, there was a government minder and it was very annoying because it's not like local people don't want you to have their photo taken. It's just like there's a level of suspicion. So if you're like, you're in a government area and you raise your camera to take something, those people themselves will go get the army and tell on you. It's actually very sad because they're suspicious. Oh, is this a terrorist? Uh, He looks like ISIS, you know, because a lot of ISIS are foreigners. 
what is he doing taking photos around here? So number one, it's someone to help translate, but also, yes, there's a paper and they can tell the army or NDF checkpoints, you know, what's going on. But at the same time, of course, they're also watching you, making sure you don't ask the wrong questions, you know, what are you doing? It, it's a, it's a police state. So that's, right. that's, that's what's going on. And to deny that would be very wrong. But I will say at the same time, those journalists who went to FSA areas, did they not have a minder as well? Were they not taken along some path of propaganda as well? Of course they were. The opposition also needs to call out the media in their favor. I mean, that's the nature of war. So for me, there's no moral, there's nothing morally wrong with seeing the war from all sides. And at this point, I've seen the war from all sides except the jihadi side. Because unfortunately, I don't think I'd be able to make it back from that one. Well, I mean, it's also important to know, and I think we talked about this with Brad Hoff a little bit, that for people who have objections to, for example, this recent strike by Trump, partly because it seemed to come out of nowhere, it was complete policy reversal from the beginning of that week. Literally Monday, he said, Assad's cool. And then that week, he's bombing him. It's also that there's people who are caught in between, and they actually... Many of them, particularly business people who who had dealt with the former Assad, it's to get to be in a police state than it is to live under a sort of theocratic, uh, murderous situation, which is what you have under these groups like Al Nusra, like these other who are foreigners, by the way, in many cases like Idlib. Idlib is, I mean, how many people in Idlib are even Syrian at this point, or at least how many of the militia groups? So. I think that's something people who are looking to want to simplify this conflict one way or the other. And I agree there's people who are in some cases excusing the Assad regime, which is a murderous, brutal regime that inspired this rebellion, are forgetting that for the common person who's just on the street, you know, just wants to hang out, just wants to kind of live their life and not be molested too much or attacked or hurt. A police state's actually a better deal, <laughs> which is sad. I mean, it's a sad commentary. Yes. Syrian people deserve more than the Syrian regime. They deserve more than Arar al-Sham. They deserve more than Jibbet al-Nusra. However, at the same time, we have to look at the reality of these Arab dictator states. They're very weak. They're propped up on a cult of personality. And when you crush that state structure, you do indeed destroy the entire country. Everyone points this out, but that's exactly what happened in Libya, in, in Iraq, everywhere. The state structure is not strong because of the history of how these state apparatus were actually set up. And the reason why the regime is so brutal is the, is an exact reflection of what has been, let's say, thrown into that region or set up in that region because of uh, historical cir- uh, circumstances. So when I come and say I went to the Damascus conference, people will call me an Assadist. And then when I go with some FSA groups, oh, you're an Al-Qaeda lover, whatever. The fact of the matter is you need to understand when you flood this region with global jihadists and they overthrow that state structure, that's a much worse outcome than it is to go about another way. So unfortunately, there's a very hard reality is why did an armed struggle happen in the first place? is because they actually had no political alternatives to the regime. So there actually is a place for armed struggle in war, let's say, or in this conflict of a brutal dictatorship. It's just how do you turn a blind eye to that being hijacked by these extremist elements and also help those elements of Muslim Brotherhood, Al-Qaeda, become the strongest because they are the best fighters. That's where all of these allies went wrong. So... That's the situation in Syria now, six years later. The rebel movement, it was never strong to begin with. But now, especially by helping them, you are inadvertently helping these extremist groups, which is much worse for the country. Especially for the minority groups, right? They're the ones really at at the most risk. And it's interesting sort of bring this back full circle. But the Kurdish groups that you have, you know, a lot of experience with, they have created this model so that the minority groups can have some self-determination and also self-defense, which they didn't have before, which makes this story a particularly rich and interesting story that you're telling. 
Yeah, no, definitely. But the problem is, of course, is SDF cannot, you know, take control of all of Syria. That's a that that's an answer for one section of Syria. And right. maybe some of their um, some of their secular reformations could influence and inspire other actors inside Syria, certainly. And maybe they could help guide them. But, you know, the other parts of Syria, that war there is kind of different ballgame, let's say. Yeah, I realize that I didn't mean to portray that as a solution for all of Syria. I just meant. Yeah. Well, is it, is it in this war, I mean, your view of it as someone who's been there and looked at it. I mean, this is just my take on it. But I think that it, it's a question if this rebellion would have e- even still be going if not for the proxy forces no pumping way. guns and new fighters into it. It right. would have been it would have been over in 2012 to 2013. I think so. If the West and the Gulf states and Turkey did not co-opt this revolution for their own nefarious goals, it would have been it would have been crushed. I think because those civilians calling for reforms, I think the regime did act violently toward them. Let's say, but what has spawned from that is a direct directly related to that region being flooded with weapons and becoming the new jihadi paradise. Right. I mean, I think when you look at the U.S. government analysis of this, the reason the Obama administration initially seemed to jump in was to say that, like Gaddafi, Assad was very tenuous. He was going to fall anyway. Let's get on the right side of this. Like they've tried to do a million times, it always fails. Well, not the right side. Let's get on the side that, that speaks to us and does economic deals with us. Right. And undermines Iran and Russia for us, yes. Yeah, right. Let's get on that side, and he's not going to last anyway, mm-hmm. so we might as well get a little aggressive here. Only to find out that unlike Gaddafi, and I guess arguably Saddam, although Saddam was a really direct overthrow, Assad doesn't just exist because he's a brutal guy. He exists because there's a coalition of people who see him as a better alternative, not a good alternative, not just religious minorities, who, by the way, yes, the Kurdish model is much nicer to them, but it, Assad sort of, you know, as long as you kiss the ring, I basically leave you alone model is a lot better than a sort of totalitarian, you know, imposition of a, a jihadist group that basically says, if you are not of the correct views, we're going to, we're going to straight up kill you. So I think it was this negotiated settlement that even his father did with the business leaders. They were willing to live with that. So I think that's what the U.S., it seems to be underestimated that he had a little bit more actual traditional constituency, if you say, than just brute force. Well, America loves dictatorships. They support a whole bunch of dictatorships, except those dictators listen to what they say and have good deals with them. The dictators they don't like, they have this rhetoric to overthrow them, such as Assad. So, you know, where's the American response on Erdogan causing his great country, Turkey's a great country, great people, to slip into this dictatorship? Nothing. Congratulations. Okay, what about Saudi Arabia, this dictatorship? Nothing. We have good business deals. Oh, so look at how America's response was throughout the Arab Spring. Which governments did they protect and not speak out against the uprisings? And which ones did they, did they speak out, out, out against? They supported the uprisings of the people who wanted to overthrow dictators that weren't listening to them, such as Assad. And again, that doesn't make me an, an Assadist to say that. It's kind of common sense of looking like Egypt, what happened there versus inside Syria. Or Bahrain. Yeah, Bahrain, yeah. That's that's a good point. I, I couldn't really speak on that one. I haven't looked at it too closely, but I'm sure. <laughs> any any Gulf state with lots of oil and money, maybe don't support <laughs> overthrowing that one because if you do a business deal with uh, Sheikh so-and-so, his son is going to also inherit the same deal down the road. So business-wise, it makes more sense to do deals with dictators for stability and reasons like that. But, you know, I, I don't think there's some Machiavellian evil council driving this. It just sort of happens by itself in the way of business and the way that, you know, lobbyists are co-opted to go with the status quo. I think that's what actually happens. So that's why this sort of hive mind t- uh, took over the psyche of Americans with the Syrian war. And that's why all journalists, not all journalists, but let's say mainstream journalists, sort of in their writing, 
co-opted and took the tone of their government itself earlier in the war. And now people are starting to see the ramifications of that and we're getting all this blowback. Yeah, and there's and there's also a sort of cynicism, I think, in the use of the humanitarian aspects of it, which, of course, it's incredibly brutal. But you've got another horrifying war that the U.S. is also directly involved in in Yemen. And it doesn't get any airtime. It doesn't get anything. But any any terrible act in Syria becomes the – here's the new Hitler. Well, I mean, Spicer kind of blew that line with his weird mm-hmm. references to World War II that aren't really accurate. But – it seems like that's a selective use of the U.S. outrage machine. And I just wonder if that has been co-opted so thoroughly to just essentially, when you look at the end of it, keep a war going that should have already ended. Yes. Well, I remember when the rebel group, I believe it was Sultan Murad, it's a Turkish-backed group inside Aleppo, used chemical weapons on Sheikh Maksud neighborhood. It's a Kurdish neighborhood. Now, it might have not been sarin. It's probably more like chlorine or some, you know, dirty bomb that they had made or whatever. But the thing is, is there was so much evidence of that. There was literally videos of a yellow cloud sitting over Sheikh Maksud. And at that time, YPG were trying to call attention to this atrocity, and nobody cared. Nobody paid attention that the rebels had used this kind of outlawed chemical weapon on a Kurdish neighborhood. Now, at the same time, I think the regime does have more responsibility than ragtag rebel groups. If they are claiming to be uh, the rulers of Syria, un- un- you know, we're going to have to judge them by different standards than some you know, Turkish-backed group uh, doing atrocities on a Kurdish village or a Kurdish neighborhood. But at the same time, there was no outrage. Nobody actually wrote about it at all. Even more disturbingly, when Turkey was completely destroying the southeast of their country in Kurdistan, actually nobody wrote about it, did a report until months and months later, meaning mainstream media. It was very troubling. Even I remember seeing on Twitter, there's people trapped in houses, trapped in basements, they're being burnt down. Uh, Civilians are being executed by Turkish police and Turkish soldiers. There's videos of it. Nothing. Nothing. So people choose their outrage to define their own purpose and their own goals in these conflicts. And I think that that kind of stuff is probably the most troubling because it directly contributes to the suffering of civilians when you have such a double standard. I couldn't agree more with that. You, you put that really well. Hey, listen, we've kept you. If you want to try to wrap this up or. Yes. Time, time flies when your tinfoil helmet's on. <laughs> <laughs> So I feel I still feel like we haven't talked enough about your work. So tell us a little bit, uh, where can people find uh, your work? Tell us about any projects, if you like, that you'd like uh, to talk about or upcoming films. Or Yeah, the best way to follow what I've got going on is um, on social media. So my Twitter and Instagram are both the same. It's joeyl.com, but dot is spelled out D-O-T-C-O-M. So J-O-E-Y-L-D-O-T-C-O-M. And that is also my website, joeyl.com, but the real.com. <laughs> and um, yeah, you can follow me. Anything I've got coming out, I will put on those channels. And um, at this time, every time I go over to that region, Iraq and Syria, I make a sort of behind the scene documentary of what goes into my photo process. And um, for my second and third trip, uh, I've actually got a big documentary I'm working on now. It's about an hour long. It's been about months and months delayed (laughs) because we're (laughs) doing translations in four different languages. But hopefully it should be soon. And if people are curious, they can follow me. And when that comes out, I'll probably do too many tweets about it. So you'll definitely find out. All right. Thank you so much for letting us interview today. No, my pleasure. We love talking to you. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And that's our show. I want to thank you for listening and a special thank you to Joey L. Follow Joey on Twitter at Joey L D O T C O M. See his work at his website, joeyl.com. If you'd like to support the show, we'd deeply appreciate it. Patreon.com slash around the empire. Five dollars a month helps us put on the show. If you'd like to do one time donations at PayPal, Dan at Shatterproof.com. 
Questions, comments, want to yell at me? Email me, dan at shatterproof.com. And please check out my and Joanne's work at shatterproof.com. Thanks a lot. See you next time. See you later. Thank you.